Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. This story began a long time ago. Timoteo Hidalgo, the leading neurosurgeon at the provincial clinic, was neither Hidalgo nor a surgeon at that time, nor even Timoteo. He was a final year student at the medical institute. He was very embarrassed by his name. It was outdated and quite strange, Timoteo Hidalgo. His mother, of Arab origin, Dahlia, wanted to name him Muhammad. His father, Rodrigo Hidalgo, preferred Hilario. They settled on Timoteo, not ours, not yours. Muhammad Hidalgo or Hilario Hidalgo didn't sound quite right either. The mixture of Arab and European blood brought into the world a boy whose nationality could not be determined by daycare providers or school teachers. According to the documents, he was Spanish, but he didn't fit the standards of Spanish appearance. He had a dusky complexion, with coarse black hair, a sharp nose, and blue eyes. Designers call this color royal blue. His appearance was not exotic, but it attracted attention, especially from his female peers, both in school and at the institute. Throughout his student years, Timoteo had one romance after another, often he didn't remember the name of his girlfriend from the day before. He listened to love stories from his friends, but didn't believe in them. Looking at his parents, he desired the same cozy family. He saw love there, but understood that he somehow had defects in this way. Well, he couldn't love. When he met a girl with whom he can live a pleasant, calm life based on trust and respect, he would propose. He might even say he loves her, as expected. Perhaps love exists in the world, but he knows nothing about it. Since it wasn't meant for him, he would live without it. Two weeks before defending his diploma, library days were announced. Students could not attend the lectures, it was not mandatory. It was assumed that all the graduating students would work day and night on their papers to defend them with dignity. It seemed as if the professors had never been students themselves. They had two weeks in early June. They decided to go to the seaside. One week for swimming, one week to finish the diploma. They flew to Valencia and planned to go to Alicant. Why? Who knows, it just worked out that way. Since they had never been there before, it seemed like Alicant was the place to go. There were elderly women with signs saying rooms for rent at the train station. Seeing four obviously cash-strapped students, the grannies quickly hid their signs and dispersed. One either desperate or generous woman approached the group. Are you students? To be honest, the conditions aren't great. It's a small house in a garden. Not even a house, just a room with four beds. It has a veranda. There's no running water in the house, only a faucet on the veranda. The toilet and shower are in the garden. The kitchen is in my house. You can come and cook if you need to. It takes 10 minutes to walk to the sea, but it's steep downhill. No, not rolling down the hill, there are steps. Those who want comfort won't come to me, but maybe it will suit you. Of course, it'll. We don't need jacuzzi baths, and we probably won't do much cooking. Will we have neighbors? No. I live uphill. My house is on the street, and yours is down below, in the garden. I have lodgers in my house, but they don't come down to the garden. Guys, this is the perfect option. I hope no one minds we won't have a toilet in the room. I think we'll only be sleeping there anyway. Yes, the road was steep downhill, but Granny Gabriella easily stepped down from step to step. The young and eager ones followed her without daring to ask for mercy. It would be shameful. But the cottage in the garden exceeded all expectations. Yes, it was a simple room with beds, but the veranda was delightful. Trees, bushes, flowers, everything was blooming and smelled amazing. They didn't ask for their names. Who cared, really? There were fig and pear embryos hanging, but they weren't ripe enough to eat. They rushed into the sea without hesitation. What bliss to have so much water. Was it cold? Come on. It was 19 degrees. The locals didn't go into the water. They came to get some fresh air. We strolled along the shore, occasionally dipping into the water for a moment and quickly retreating. It was cold. 
In the evening, we went to a cafe. Well, more like a small eatery. But it had to be fun and cheap for our students. It was relatively cheap, but truly fun. As expected, we only returned to the cottage on the hill to sleep. After a couple of days, Timoteo decided that he should at least see some sights. His friends didn't support his idea of the beach, the cafe, and the girls were more interesting. Wandering around the city, Timoteo decided to go to the mountains. Firstly, it wasn't far. Secondly, it was cheap. But something else attracted him. Many famous people had seen the beach next to the cliff. The excursion was a sea tour. Ten tourists were loaded onto a small boat, and they embarked on a one-and-a-half-hour journey. The boat glided swiftly over the waves. The water outside was dark blue and glistening with sunlight. The sun, the sea, the rocky shore, and the loud, cheerful music quickly lifted the mood. There was some wild, inexplicable joy, a sense of boundless freedom, and a premonition of happiness. At the helm there was a short, sturdy, sun-kissed sea wolf. He looked as if he were not steering a small boat, but at least a cruise liner. To imagine that he spends his whole day shuttling tourists back and forth was impossible. No, he did it all just for them. And he was smiling radiantly only for them. After half an hour, when the initial impression had settled a bit, Timoteo began to observe his fellow passengers. He didn't want to sit alone throughout the trip. He wanted to engage in conversation. Two enthusiastic elderly ladies who never let go of their cameras. A group at the stern who started drinking beer on the beach and had no plans to stop. Some business travelers who had engaged a pleasant middle-aged lady. A young mother with two children chasing them around the boat. In the far corner, there was a girl sitting. She couldn't take her eyes off the passing cliffs. It was evident that she enjoyed the scenery outside. Timoteo watched her for a while, realized she was alone, and decided to approach her. Hello. The girl looked at him, and Timoteo was amazed. He never believed that you could look into someone's eyes and forget who you are and where you are. He couldn't see himself from the outside, but he suspected that he looked foolish. He approached her himself and stood there saying nothing. Are you also on the tour? Oh God, what an idiot. He considered himself irresistible, cool, and insensitive, yet he couldn't string two words together. I'm sorry, I got a bit flustered. My name is Timoteo. My name is Toya. Don't worry so much, have a seat. I'm also bored alone. As they sailed towards the cliff, Timoteo and Toya had already engaged in a lively conversation. They found each other interesting, and the unexpected encounter excited them. It quickly became clear that the communication wouldn't stop after the trip to the cliff and back. Toya came to the seaside with a friend who, on the very first day, started a romance with a local guy and left with him for Valencia the day before. Toya decided that if her friend had abandoned her, she wouldn't stay at home either. Sunbathing on the beach was not interesting, especially since she didn't swim much, so she went on a tour. The cliff was majestic and white and the beach turned out to be quite small. It looked more significant in the photos. They docked at the shore. The rocks resembled the ones along the entire coast. The captain explained that if they had come a couple of weeks later, he would have taken them to the open sea for a swim. But it wasn't the season yet. On the way back, the captain decided to add some excitement and directed the boat towards the waves. Passengers were splashed with a fountain of spray. They disembarked wet but satisfied. They didn't want to part ways. They strolled along the promenade and had some ice cream. Timoteo couldn't understand why his heart contracted when he looked at Toya. It had never happened before. Was it love? So, that was how it felt. They agreed to meet tomorrow at the promenade under the Chupa Chups. That's what the locals called the Port Authority building. It resembled a tall tower with a large sphere on top where the control room was located. Timoteo's friends hardly saw him. He occasionally rushed to change clothes and get a little sleep. The rest of the time, he spent with Toya. He didn't answer their questions or pay attention to their teasing. 
he simply disappeared from their lives. When the vacation was over and it was time to leave, he seriously considered staying for another week. Timoteo, are you coming or not? The train to the airport is in the evening. I don't know yet. Let's meet at the station. Today, everything had to be decided whether to leave or stay, when and where to meet after the vacation. He flew for a date, dreaming and waiting. But Toya didn't come to Chupa Chups. He waited for her for half a day. He hoped she would appear any minute. Why didn't he take her phone number or address? He thought he would have time. He didn't even know her last name. He ran to the house where Toya and her friend rented a room. The landlady was just finishing cleaning the room. Hello, do you remember me? Of course, you came with Toya. They left just now. How do you mean they left? When? Yes, this morning, they left. Do you know where they went? Maybe you saw their passports? Yes, I didn't ask. They called and asked if there were any available spots and if they could come. And now it's not peak season yet, so there are vacancies. So they came. Although the second one, Natalia, seems to have gone somewhere after a few days, but Toya stayed. They paid when they arrived, so why would we need their passports? But this morning Natalia rushed in, seemed out of sorts. It was clear that something had happened. They were packing their belongings and heading to the train station. It seemed like they were taking the train somewhere. That's it. It was the dead end. Timoteo didn't even know where she was from. She mentioned living in a small town not too far away that it could be reached by train in about five hours. She was studying, I think, at a university. Probably in Valencia, though I'm not sure. Oh, there it was. She was a philologist. She studied English and German languages, but specialized in German. How would that help in the search? He made it to the airport. Throughout the journey, he thought he should have stayed, tried to find Toya. Despair overwhelmed him. He realized vividly that fate had given him a chance to be happy, and he had missed it. Returning home, Timoteo couldn't find his place, berating himself with every word. How could he not even know her last name? Now he knew what love was, but he didn't understand how to live without his beloved one. But he somehow managed to live. College, residency, first scientific articles, defending his doctoral thesis, and work, work. A few fleeting and lukewarm romances. That was his entire personal life. He became tougher, more heartless. It was easier for him to initiate new connections and just as easy to cut them off. He didn't get attached to anyone, didn't let anyone get close. He was building his career. He became the city's best neurosurgeon and one of the best in the country. His colleagues regarded him as a high-class professional, but an unsociable and not particularly pleasant person to be around. His parents worried that their son would never start a family. It was about time, and they wanted grandchildren. They tried to help, inviting highly respectable girls to their home. But Timoteo seemed to be oblivious. He behaved extremely politely, seeing them off to their homes, returning and looking with the eyes of a lonely person. Father Rodrigo believed that his son had not yet met his true love, while Mother Dahlia felt that he had met her but lost her, hence the agony. In the early years, Timoteo often imagined accidentally meeting Toya. It could happen, such capricious twists of fate do occur. He constantly scrutinized the faces of passing women, especially at airports and train stations. Years went by, and Toya never appeared. Gradually, he weaned himself from the foolish habit of searching for Toya in crowds. Five years had passed, enough of dreaming. But he couldn't banish her from his dreams. He forbade himself to dream and stopped searching for Toya. He even attempted to live like everyone else and got married. It seemed like he had thought through and calculated everything. They had common professional interests. She was beautiful and intelligent. Timoteo thought there would be enough mutual respect to live, if not in love, then in harmony, so that he proposed. Ophelia was a smart woman. 
She noticed that her future husband wasn't on fire with love, but she agreed anyway. Apparently, there were reasons for it. Soon enough, Timoteo realized that his theory of a happy marriage built on trust and respect was falling apart. The beautiful wife didn't bring him joy. He didn't want to go home and pretend everything was fine. The obligation to attend social gatherings and theater together was burdensome. The thought of living like that for the rest of his life made him sick. After a year, Timoteo realized that there was no room for happiness in his life. How could he change that? He didn't know. He had arranged his life this way and now couldn't imagine how to get out of it. Unexpectedly, Ophelia, who turned out to be truly intelligent, helped him. She saw and understood everything. She didn't want to wait until their family life reached the stage of I can't stand seeing you. One weekend, when Timoteo was lamenting that he didn't have to go to work and would have to spend the whole day together, she suddenly said, Timoteo, let's get a divorce. Stop pretending to be a family. It's not working out. Ophelia, what are you talking about? Why do you think so? We seem to be living fine. Exactly, just fine. You know, you often call someone named Toya in your sleep. Well, at least you don't call me that. You must love her. It hurts, of course, that you don't love me, but there's nothing to be done about it. I've loved and lost someone too. I know what it's like. Are you saying it's fate to lose love? It's not a fate, it's the law of meanness. I fell in love for the first time at 17. Naturally, it's for life at that age. I saw him and swooned. And he invited me on a date. Can you imagine? I wake up in the morning, and in the evening, I have a date, but there's a pimple on my nose. You wouldn't understand. It's the end of the world. Life is falling apart, Ophelia laughed. Well, of course, I cried my eyes out all day. My friend didn't know how to console me. I didn't go on the date but my faithful friend did. And she stole my boyfriend. That's how tragic my first love was. It's funny now, but back then, it wasn't funny. And then there was a real, great love that I lost, just like you. I know how painful it is. Will you tell me about it? No, I don't want to dredge it up. Besides, why would you need to know? Deal with your own. We're the same, living without joy. We can't be together. We won't survive. That doesn't seem right. According to the rules, we should now spend a long time intelligently discussing why our life together didn't work out, who's to blame, and what to do. Then we must forgive each other for everything that was and wasn't, and then definitely give each other another chance. Let these rules go to the hell. Let's just get divorced. That will be our chance. So, the family life ended without dramatic quarrels, although it wasn't easy. Timoteo decided for himself that he would never get married again. It turned out that trust and respect weren't enough to live in joy. Timoteo immersed himself in his work. He performed the most complex surgeries, and the clinic's reputation relied heavily on his name. They didn't refer to it as the Neurosurgery Clinic, they called it the Hidalgo Clinic. Here, he was a king and a god. His authority was unquestionable. Perhaps, besides work, Timoteo had no other interests. Only work brought him joy. Timoteo, the chief wants to see you, someone said. The nurses froze when they saw Timoteo. He was impossibly handsome. It was a shame he was so oblivious. No matter how hard they tried, he never noticed anyone. Thank you, ladies, Timoteo replied. The chief physician of the clinic jumped up from his desk and rushed to embrace Timoteo upon seeing him. Timoteo, your work has caused a sensation. He exclaimed. What work? Timoteo asked. Well, we submitted your article to the neurosurgeon forum. They're inviting you to a conference. Daniel, we have plenty of excellent surgeons. Why me all of a sudden? Don't be modest. You're the best we have. The conference is in Valencia in two days. Timoteo wanted to resist a little. After all, there were many good surgeons, 
and it wasn't certain that he was the most deserving. But then he thought, why not? They're the ones offering. It's pleasant to consider oneself noble, and he did want to visit Valencia. He hadn't been on vacation in a long time, and there would be the sea, the sun, and it was July. It was the height of the season. When else would he have the chance to visit the warm sea? With this kind of work, he wouldn't even have time in December. That's it. The decision is made. He's going there. He didn't volunteer himself. His conscience is clear. He'd figure out the nobility later, somehow. For two days, Timoteo was spinning like a squirrel in a cage. It turned out he had a lot of things to finish before leaving. He forgot about sleep. He had to hurry. He planned to sleep on the plane. It's a two and a half hour flight across the country. Plenty of time to catch up on rest. As Timoteo settled into his seat on the plane, he immediately asked for a blanket, relaxed, and informed the flight attendant that he wouldn't eat or drink and requested not to be disturbed. He fell asleep right away, even before takeoff. Toya appeared in his dream. She often appeared, she was tender and sweet and called him somewhere. But as always, in the dream, he ran but didn't move from his spot. Today, she wasn't just calling, he sensed trouble, but he couldn't reach her, couldn't help. Through his slumber, he heard her voice saying, Doctor, Doctor. He didn't know if it was in his dream or reality, but he couldn't wake up. His seatmate nudged him on the shoulder. Timoteo opened his eyes. Are you a doctor by any chance? What happened? Someone seems to be unwell, and they're looking for a doctor. There are no doctors on the plane. I woke you up. What if? You did the right thing by waking me up. I'm a doctor. The flight attendants were running around the cabin, waking up sleeping passengers, apologizing, and asking, Are you a doctor? Timoteo, with a heavy head and poor coordination after waking up, stopped one of the frantic flight attendants. I'm a doctor, he said. She looked at him skeptically, but there was no other option. What kind of doctor are you? She asked. What kind do you need? Timoteo replied. If only I knew. A child is feeling unwell. Can you help? Well, it's a good thing it's not a dog. I'm not a veterinarian. Although I'm not a pediatrician either. But at least it's a human being. Show me her. They cleared a space at the end of the cabin and set up some seats. There lay a six-year-old girl, breathing heavily. At first glance, Timoteo couldn't understand what was wrong with her. And he couldn't understand, he wasn't a pediatrician, not even a general practitioner. It wasn't his specialization. But the girl needed to be saved. And there was nothing at hand. Ladies, he addressed the flight attendants, do you have a stethoscope, a blood pressure monitor, or anything? Bring everything and all the medications available on board. And clear everyone out of here. The flight attendants brought everything they could find and ushered away all the curious onlookers. Timoteo quickly inspected the medical kit. It contained a decent assortment of medications for all kinds of situations. Timoteo listened attentively, observed closely, and touched the girl. When she lost consciousness, he revived her. Her heart was fluttering, beating irregularly. He administered injections. For two hours, he fought to bring her back from the other side. The girl breathed evenly and fell asleep. Timoteo sat there, listening to her pulse, overwhelmed by a tremendous fatigue. It felt like performing surgery would be easier. But the girl slept, breathing peacefully. His vision was blurred as he was exhausted, and tears welled up in his eyes. He felt like he had just accomplished the most important task of his life. This saved girl was the most precious thing. Please keep an eye on her. If anything happens, call me. And contact the airport. Tell them to prepare emergency medical assistance. Moving with difficulty, Timoteo stumbled to his seat, sat down, and passed out. And again, Toya appeared in his dream. She beckoned and, for some reason, said, Doctor, thank you. She had never said anything like that in seven years. Startled, Timoteo woke up. Toya. 
he exclaimed. Was he awake or were it hallucinations? Toya was standing by his seat. He reached out to hug her but hesitated. How could he embrace a mirage? No, he had to wake up first. This was an incorrect dream. And Toya wasn't the same as she had always appeared in his dreams. He rubbed his eyes. No, she didn't disappear. It was a strange state. It couldn't be, but he could see her. Toya, the mirage, gently stroked Timoteo's cheek and said, Timoteo, while you were saving my daughter, they wouldn't let me through. They said the doctor forbade it. Then you went to your seat, and I thought I was hallucinating due to nerves. They said the doctor saved my girl. If there hadn't been a doctor on board, things could have ended badly. So, I went to thank the doctor, and there you are. It's such a relief. I haven't gone crazy, and it's not a hallucination. Is it really you? How is this possible, Toya? How did you end up here? That's a strange question, although you've always asked unconventional questions. I'm flying to Valencia, just like everyone else on this plane. With my daughter. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't have made it. Is this girl your daughter? Yes. And now I owe you for the rest of my life. You saved my daughter. Wait, is it really you? Where is the girl's father? You're being too abrupt, Timoteo. I'm very grateful to you, but that's really none of your business. You tell me, how is Anna? Is something serious going on? They said something about her heart. Can a girl her age have heart attacks? Unfortunately, yes. But I can't tell you the reason. I'm a surgeon, not a specialist in pediatric illnesses. We'll land soon, and there will be a pediatric cardiologist who can give you more information. I'll go to my daughter. We'll talk later. Toya left, and Timoteo still couldn't believe it was her. He felt scared. What if she disappeared again? No, he would shatter into pieces before allowing that to happen. It didn't matter if she was married or not, how many husbands or children she had. He wouldn't let her go again. He simply couldn't. He had lived without her for too long, and he couldn't bear it any longer. If happiness can descend upon someone, it had done so. It was unthinkable and boundless. Now he could truly live. Hey, doctor. His neighbor grabbed Timoteo's hand. Are you okay? I haven't felt this good in seven years. The plane landed and rolled along the runway. An ambulance raced to keep up. Timoteo understood that they would soon bring the stairs and Toya would get into the car with her daughter and leave. Of course, finding a hospital in the city where they would take the girl was not a problem. But he couldn't take the risk. What if Toya took her daughter and went home and he, like a complete idiot, didn't even get her phone number? He frantically tugged at his seatbelt, but it wouldn't unbuckle. Stay calm. Pull yourself together. He unfastened it, jumped up from his seat, and rushed to the back of the cabin. The flight attendants ran after him. Please, sit down. You can't stand up right now. They grabbed Timoteo's hands, trying to return him to his seat. I need to get to the girl. She might be in trouble. I might be in trouble. Ladies, you are my only hope now. My life depends on you. The flight attendants didn't understand what his life had to do with them, but his words were so heartfelt, and the doctor looked so distressed that they decided not to argue. They led him to the back of the cabin, but stayed nearby, keeping an eye on him. It was intriguing, after all, what kind of life drama was unfolding. Toya, I understand you don't have time for me, but don't you dare disappear again. I might be caught as well. There, near the arrivals area, some guy with a sign saying Hidalgo has been waiting for hours. I can't go with you. Promise me we'll meet. No, don't promise, swear it. We must meet. We will meet. Write down my phone number. The plane came to a stop. Toya and her daughter were allowed to exit first. Timoteo watched her walk away, and he started panicking. She was leaving again. Everything was falling apart again. It can't be true, not twice in a row.
Timoteo rushed to the exit, but it was impossible to push through the crowd of passengers who had been sitting in the plane for over two hours. Even if you were a doctor, the one they would later tell stories about, recounting the incident on the plane, even if you were the savior of humanity, Bruce Willis himself wouldn't have been able to save the world if he had to make his way through a crowd of weary passengers. When Timoteo finally made it onto the stairs, the ambulance was already flashing its lights at the airport exit. Well, at least he had her phone number. The guy with the Hidalgo sign was impatiently hopping by the exit from the arrivals area. He picked up the distinguished guest and hurried off to the hotel. He warned Timoteo that they needed to be back in an hour and the drive would take half an hour without traffic. So, if he wanted to take a shower, he had to do it quickly and then they should have gone. A very energetic young man. Well, it made sense, he was at work and Timoteo didn't come here on a vacation. But the weather in Valencia didn't encourage to work. The sun was shining, flowers were fragrant, the sea was roaring, and palm trees shamelessly peered into the windows. How could anyone work in this city? It was a mystery. No, no time to relax. He came for a conference. He had to listen to all the presentations, participate in discussions, pretend to be genuinely interested. And he wanted to go to the seaside and see Toya. Or to say, he wanted to be with Toya. And the fact that there was the sea here was a pleasant bonus. So the first day of the conference passed with thoughts of Toya and the sea. Although Timoteo was preoccupied with purely personal problems, he noticed the high level of presentations and even became interested in some interesting developments by his colleagues. Returning to the hotel in the evening, he immediately started calling Toya. No answer. How can that be? What now? But regardless of the torment, he was hungry. He went down to the restaurant and, like a lone wolf, settled in a distant corner of the hall. He didn't feel like socializing with colleagues or with the attractive girls who had been glancing at him with interest since he entered. Timoteo, do you mind if I sit down? Toya stood in front of the table. Toya? How did you find me? Newton's binomial. It's not difficult to find out where a conference participant, organized by our agency, is staying. And I've known for a long time that you're a neurosurgeon. One can open any medical forum, and there you are. First, a rising star, then a shining one. So, Dr. Hidalgo, I know a lot about you. And your wife is very beautiful. She also has great potential. She's my ex-wife. What? my ex-wife but she does have potential she's smart and talented she was unlucky to have me i valued her but couldn't love her because besides you i can't love anyone else it's good that she's so intelligent she let me go you know when a man starts confessing his love after so many years it feels like an attempt to start a fleeting affair during a business trip like, I loved you, I remember everything, and you did too. Let's not waste time. You seem attractive, I'm damn attractive. It's a bit tacky. We already had a resort affair. It ended a long time ago, and predictably. And you never talked about love. Why now? I never talked about it? That can't be. I thought I was talking about it all the time. Did I really not talk about it? My wife left me when she realized I only loved you. I talked to you at night. Toya, why did you disappear seven years ago? I don't think this is the right place for heartfelt conversations. Are you attending the conference tomorrow? Let's go for a walk and talk in the evening. Anna is in the hospital. They say she needs to be observed, so there's no need to rush home. So you're not here on vacation? No, I live in Valencia. My mom got married and flew north with her beloved. Anna and I flew to visit her. It's getting late. I'll go now. See you tomorrow. I'll walk you out. But Toya just shook her head so convincingly that Timoteo didn't dare to disobey. Well, until tomorrow then. The entire next day, 
Timoteo actively participated in seminars and discussions, trying to keep himself busy to think less about Toya. He constantly checked the time and wondered why it was standing still. The day seemed endless. It felt like evening would never come to this southern city. Toya called several times, and Timoteo froze if she didn't pick up the phone for a long time. He worried and tried to come up with what he would say. He worried even more when he thought about what she might say. He had already gone through their entire conversation in his mind, both his part and hers. Oh God, what an idiot he was. Acting like a schoolboy before his first date. He was a smart, mature, serious man, but he couldn't keep himself together. He couldn't because he had been waiting for this meeting for many years. It seemed like the most important thing was to find Toya, and everything would naturally fall into place, everything would be as it was before. He never seriously considered the possibility that she might not want to return to the past. She had her own life, a husband, a daughter. It never crossed his mind that Toya could be happy without him. It seemed like they would meet, and she would run off with her beloved to the ends of the earth. Maybe she would run off, but there was no guarantee that the beloved one was him. If you were to look at the passions raging in Timoteo's soul from the outside, it would seem like there was nothing to suffer about. What's so special about it? It was a young love that remained a bright memory for some people throughout their lives. It seemed that if they had stayed together back then, life would have been a continuous celebration. Most likely, it wouldn't have been. He would have suffered, been disappointed, and doubted just the same. How many such stories are there? But everyone is convinced that such a thing only happened to them, and nobody on earth suffered like they did. Even if they told Timoteo that there were countless similar stories before and after him, he still wouldn't believe it. But Timoteo couldn't look at himself from a detached perspective. He had worked himself up so much that he approached the meeting place with a pounding and roaring heart. Toya stood by the railing, looking at the sea. She was remarkably beautiful, even more so than in her youth. Timoteo tried to figure out how old she was. If she was around 22 back then, she would be around 30 now. How did she live all these years? She was probably married. Or was she? He would ask now. But he was afraid to hear that she was married and happy. Well, what did you expect, Timoteo? A first-class surgeon, a man of dreams. What were you hoping for? That she had been waiting for you all these years, withering away? It couldn't be that way. She was looking fantastic. And there was a child. Timoteo caught himself thinking that he was jealous. He had no right to, considering his own past, but he was jealous. Toya, hello. Timoteo kissed Toya, thinking about how she would react. Would she push him away or would she be offended? No. But she looked at him strangely, almost with a smirk. It was time to ask questions, and he was scared, his heart ready to leap out of his chest. Will you tell me where you disappeared to back then? It happened foolishly. I came with my friend Natalia. She met some macho man. She went on a couple of dates with him and ran off to Valencia. She said it was love. I tried to talk her out of it. I had a feeling that the guy was shady. But she already had starry eyes and couldn't hear anything. She ran off. It turned out her otherworldly love was deeply and firmly married. And his wife, seasoned by life experience, had long learned to quickly and accurately identify a fiancé and eliminate rivals. When we arrived in Valencia, we stayed at a cottage belonging to some friends. And when her lover briefly left, retribution came, his wife stepped into the picture. It didn't end with just a verbal battle. A stool came into play. In short, Natalia barely escaped. As she was running away, the wife yelled after her that she couldn't hide, that she knew her address and would find her there. Natalia came back with a bruise under her eye, screaming and crying. We quickly packed our things and got away from there. Why did you go with her? I couldn't leave her alone. She wasn't in a good state. Besides, you know, when you're afraid, you tend to exaggerate things. She was hysterical, and I got scared too. 
And where did you go? Where else? We rushed back home. They definitely won't find us in our small town. Yes, it's a strange story. They walked along the waterfront. Timoteo desperately wanted to hug Toya, to hold her close and never let go. The sea murmured, palm trees rustled, and the impossibly large moon shone. And Timoteo mustered the courage to ask the ultimate question. How have you been all these years? How was she doing? Differently. She defended her diploma, finished college, and then realized she was pregnant. She returned to her hometown, prepared for Anna's birth, and gave up on her career and personal life, living on memories. But Toya had no intention of discussing that with Timoteo. Everything else could be talked about, but not that. How have I been? Well, it was okay. Although I had to come back to my hometown. My mother fell ill, and I had to be with her. In the town where Toya lived, a family of four arrived, a couple in their 50s with two sons. The elder one, Nacho, was around 25 years old, while the younger, Leonilo, was still in school. They bought several hectares of land to build private houses. Real estate in the area was skyrocketing in value, so they decided to build a small cottage settlement on the outskirts. It wasn't a coastal area, but it was only a five-hour drive to the sea. If they built affordable houses with minimal amenities, there would be buyers. They didn't go wrong. The first three houses didn't sell for a long time, but then it started rolling like a snowball. However, the settlement ended up not having a young population. The town was small with several chain stores, two schools, and a cultural center. It was a typical provincial town. There were several sculptures, a cultural center with columns, and a park with a rotunda behind it. It was a place where almost the entire town gathered on holidays. There was a small, incredibly beautiful lake with lotus flowers and two parks, places where mothers with children and elderly people strolled. Although the parks could have been omitted because every street could be called a park itself, every plot was a flower bed. The youth didn't come here, there were no career prospects. It was beautiful but boring. There was a sanatorium with a mineral spring and a brewery. Those were the only enterprises in the town. The employment situation was really poor. However, elderly people willingly moved to warmer regions. They had worked enough and wanted to bath in the sun during their old age. Besides, it was so quiet and peaceful there. The affordable houses on the outskirts of the town near the forest suited their pockets and tastes. When Toya returned to the town, her mother, who was a teacher, didn't yell at her, saying things like, you've gone wild, I told you, and all the other things that unmarried pregnant daughters usually hear in the depths of the provinces. She pragmatically concluded that Toya should have got a job to later go on maternity leave. The principal of the local school was delighted and beamed as if he had staffed the entire state rather than having just one foreign language teacher for a few months. One day, Nacho came to pick up his brother from school and saw Toya. From that day on, his brother never walked to or from school. Nacho wasn't mentally challenged and clearly saw that Toya was expecting a child. But he fell in love so deeply that he didn't care about Toya's past or whose child it was. Toya believed that it was all wrong and didn't make any promises. Nacho was a pleasant young man, but nothing more. Then her mother added fuel to the fire. Think twice, the child needs a father. Exactly. A father, not a stranger who is in love now and might decide he made a mistake tomorrow. But where is this father? You haven't even told me who he is. Toya, I'm not trying to convince you. It's nauseating for me to suggest that you get married without love. But your love is somewhere unknown, and you won't fall in love with anyone else. I know, we're all like that. Mom, why are you being so gloomy? You lived alone and didn't rush to marry the first person you met. I did. And now I'm thinking, maybe I should get married? It's better to do it and regret it. Don't be so scared, I'm not going to run away tomorrow, but I'll think about it. Maybe there's no need to shed pounds on your own? I'll share mine. Well, you woman definitely can surprise, be careful. 
I'm a girl who's a little bit pregnant. I hope nothing goes wrong. Why were you silent? Tell me. I will, but when there will be something to tell. And you should keep an eye on Nacho. He's a good guy, a businessman. True, it's a family business, but he's smart, he'll make his way. While Toya and her mother were deciding whom to marry, Nacho had already made up his mind. His decision, to say the least, shocked his parents. He was handsome, wealthy, with a promising future ahead, and he got involved with some girl, pregnant from someone else. You've gone mad. Out of all the girls circling around you, you chose the most unsuitable one, his mother exclaimed. Mom, she wasn't circling around. If anything, I was the one maneuvering to get her attention. What's wrong with Toya? She's beautiful, well-educated, Nacho defended. She got knocked up by God knows who, despite her education and upbringing. And you, like a complete idiot, are willing to take on someone else's child from an unknown bastard. You won't dare bring her into our home. His mother raged. This is my home too. But you're right, she has no place in this house. Either way, you won't give her a chance at life. Mom, I'm your son, but you're forcing me to choose. Can't you guess whom I'll choose? If Toya agrees, I'll marry her without seeking your blessing, Nacho declared. I don't want to see that girl in my house. His mother proclaimed. Well, that's it, Nacho replied. It was crystal clear. Of course, Nacho's parents loved him. They started the construction business solely for the sake of their sons. After graduation, Nacho worked alongside his parents, gaining experience. Invisible to all, he gradually took over the business, and no one objected. He possessed knowledge and some special entrepreneurial intuition. His parents were proud of their son, so his decision to marry an unknown girl came as a shock. They couldn't understand how he even noticed her. According to them, girls of that sort were invisible to smart, ambitious boys. His mother realized with surprise that her son wasn't ready to submit to their will. Of course, he wouldn't sever ties with them because of Toya, but he would definitely distance himself. He would live his own life, or rather, a life shared with Toya. When longtime friends with grown-up children gathered, the conversation usually revolved around their children, how talented and successful they were. No, no, I don't keep my child close to me. They've long been independent, living their own lives. None of them would admit that they would tie their child to themselves if they could, just to keep them from leaving. They let go, of course, they resigned themselves to it, but deep down, they were certain that they wouldn't love anyone the way they loved their mothers. As if they themselves weren't once young and didn't run after their own love, forgetting about their parents. But there was someone to run after back then, and now, what was there? Nacho's parents couldn't decide on what to do. They didn't intend to interfere with Nacho's choice and couldn't risk their relationship with their son. They held on to hope that Toya would refuse. But Nacho insisted that she didn't want to hear about marriage. However, his mother didn't believe that calculating bitch for a moment. She reasoned soberly that Toya was just playing coy. Who would refuse the opportunity to marry a young, financially stable, all-around positive man? and to have a child born, being married. Furthermore, Nacho didn't back down, he persistently proved his love to Toya. Toya had grown accustomed to him always being there, he was attentive and caring. Both she and her mother needed assistance. It was challenging for two women, one of them pregnant, to maintain the household. They needed man's hands, and Nacho was always there, rushing to help at the first call. Mom looked at Toya and sighed. Why was her daughter so clueless? Couldn't she see that the guy loved her? What was she waiting for? Toya saw and understood everything. She had to make a decision either agree or let Nacho go. Eventually, she would have to accept it and start building a life without him. Toya liked Nacho. Mom was right, he was the solution to all their problems. Toya was ready to agree, but she was bothered by Nacho's parents' attitude towards her. Toya, if you don't want to live with my parents, we won't. I never planned to spend my whole life in this town. 
I already have plans and savings. Let's get married and leave. And my parents will have nothing to do. They will come to terms with it. Don't pressure me. There's still time. I'll think about it after giving birth. No, the child should be born within a marriage. Otherwise, we'll have to go through adoption. There will surely be kind people who, out of natural honesty, will tell him that his dad is not his biological father. Then they'll watch with curiosity what becomes of it. But if we're married, they won't be able to undermine us. Both mom and dad will be on the birth certificate. Nacho, let's wait for now. I promise I'll think about it. Think, but not for too long. Pregnancy is a temporary condition, and we can't ask it to wait. Toya Timoteo didn't share this part of her story with him. There was no need for him to know. In short, it went like this. She lived with her mom, got married, moved to Valencia, gave birth to a daughter. There was nothing more to hide, and Toya told him how it happened, except for some details. After all, Nacho convinced her. Or maybe it was her mom who wanted her daughter to be happy. Or perhaps her friend Natalia, who believed that Toya was wasting her time and systematically nagged her. Don't be a fool. If you let Nacho slip away, you'll regret it. You'll end up like your mom, alone for the rest of your life. By the way, mom is planning to get married. Yeah, you also want to wait until you're at that age and then start a new happy life? Don't you plan on doing it sooner? Look around you. Hey, guys, where are you? There's only one decent one, and he's chasing after you. If he noticed me, I'd be head over heels, but you keep turning away. Toya, don't be stupid. How are you and your mom going to raise the child on her salary and your maternity leave? A secure life with someone who loves you is within your reach. You may not get another chance like this. Natalia, I need not only someone who loves me, but someone I love too. Come on, wait for your Timoteo. You'll wait for about 30 years, and then you'll meet an old, alcoholic man who won't even remember your name. He might not even remember everyone he slept with at the resort. They pressed and pressed from all sides. But was it appropriate to show yourself off? That was not the situation to do it. What love, what Timoteo. Will there ever be one? Nacho is really nice. Maybe I'll love him later, but for now, I need to get married, have a child, and live a peaceful, stable life. As Natalia says, we'll think about love later. And Toya agreed. Nacho, as he promised, didn't bring her to his parents' house. Right after a modest wedding, he took her to Valencia. They had a small apartment there and a modest private house construction company. After Anna's birth, Toya stayed home for another year, but then she decided that she hadn't studied for that. She got a job as a translator in a company organizing international conferences. Within a couple of years, she became the head of the translation department. Her old friend Natalia worked there too and was an invaluable employee. Nobody worked better with the Japanese than her. Their family life was calm. There were no outbursts, but there was stability instead. Toya even believed that she and Nacho had an ideal family. There were no passions, but there was respect and understanding. Everything suited her, and she somehow missed the moment when Nacho got tired of a life without outbursts and longed for emotions and strong feelings. The conference was delayed by about eight hours. Something didn't work out for the organizers, and unexpectedly, Toya got an unplanned day off. It was frustrating that they didn't inform her in the morning. She could have stayed at home and not taken Anna to daycare. Spending a whole day with her daughter was a luxury. Toya daydreamed about coming home now, calmly and leisurely enjoying a cup of coffee, going to the store, and finally preparing a proper family dinner. It was rare for her to have the peace to cook something delicious. She needed to call Nacho and tell him not to be late. Toya entered the apartment and went straight to the kitchen. She turned on the coffee machine and went to the bedroom to change her clothes. When she opened the door, there was an unexpected sight. Nacho and his secretary, Luz, were there. Damn, it was scandalous and awkward. And it seemed that Toya was the only one feeling awkward. Luz was sitting, 
covering herself with a blanket, and her eyes held an unmistakable sense of superiority. After an initial moment of confusion, Nacho put on a confident face and was about to say something. Don't bother, I got it. It's not what I thought. You have a meeting in an innovative format. Don't be distracted, I accidentally walked in, I'm leaving. But let's agree that you won't come home to sleep tonight. I don't want to confront you in front of our child. As Toya left the apartment, she could hear Lou squealing something. Apparently, she was emphasizing the advantages of the situation that had arisen to Nacho. You don't have to hide anymore. You're all mine. In response, Nacho grumbled something. Apparently, he didn't appreciate the unexpected turn of events. Toya walked through the park, wondering where to go until the evening. It was hurtful and somewhat disdainful, but not a tragedy. She suddenly realized that it had to happen this way. It was strange that she hadn't realized it earlier. The idea of marrying him was wrong. One cannot get married without love. It was easier for her, no broken heart. Nacho got the full impact. He wasn't cheating, he was trying to fill the void. For so many years, he had hoped that his love would be enough for both of them. He couldn't handle her cold nature. She pitied him, and she pitied herself. Why am I so inadequate? I bring no happiness to anyone. Well, Natalia, my friend, get ready. I'll come over now, and you'll listen to the confession of a woman who ruined her own life and that of a very good person. That was it. Family life didn't work out. But there was Anna and work, so she could still live. Her mom started acting up too, seriously considering getting married. She had been thinking about it for many years, and now she had made up her mind. She was very worried that her daughter wouldn't approve. But her daughter thought that if her mom was leaving the South and going to the North, it meant she had to be with this person. She really liked her mom's chosen one. He was concise and thorough. The way he looked at her mom made Toya's heart skip a beat. And she believed that someday someone would look at her the same way. Her mom worried about leaving her alone. But her daughter reassured her that she could handle it and would gladly visit her on vacation. There must be at least one happy woman in the family, why not you? They said their goodbyes, kissed, and her mom left. Bloom has descended, she wanted to cry. She was happy for mom, but she wanted happiness for me too. Nacho left Toya's apartment and moved. True, not to lose apartment. Their relationship didn't work out either. Toya didn't try to win him back. This page was turned. She wanted him to be happy. Life was settled, improved. She had daughter, work, Natalia with her endless romances. There was enough adrenaline, no time to be bored. And love. Well, love. It's good that a person has it. At least she knew what it is, and she was grateful for that. As promised to mom, they went on vacation up north. She was a bit nervous. What if she saw that mom was unhappy, regretting her decision? But mom was absolutely happy. She enthusiastically talked about her wonderful Maikilo, her extraordinary city. And the fishing. Look at these mushrooms. I picked them myself. I'll give you some. And there's also jam made from forest berries. You'll take that too. Mom, calm down. I won't carry jars with me. Tell me about yourself, not about mushrooms and berries. What can I say? I'm to blame in front of you. I'm an old fool. I convinced you to marry Nacho. I thought it would be better that way, not being alone. I only realize now, there is no happiness without love. It might seem funny when an old aunt talks about love, but you know, I'm not ashamed. I've never been this happy. And my Maikilo is so reliable that I don't even doubt, it's forever. We'll live together as long as we have left. Mama, Toya hugged her mom and couldn't hold back tears. You waited for happiness, and I'm happy for you. Yeah, I'm happy, you're happy. We should be careful not to be drowned in happiness. Tell me, do you still live alone? Is it really such a blow to family life that you don't even hope? Looking at you, I hope for the best. Stop teasing me. 
You don't have to wait for my age to get married. Maybe the third eye opened, or maybe I sense it with my heart, but you won't remain alone for long. Thank you, fortune teller. Whether mom was a fortune teller or not, Timoteo turned out to be on the plane. Toya told Timoteo this story, skirting the sharp edges. When Timoteo listened, he thought how similar it was. It was like they had one life for the two of them. And now they stood together at the edge of the sea, as if those years, shed tears, and foolish marriages never happened. The conference lasted for ten days. They could have made a stricter schedule and finished in five, but the organizers were understanding people. The participants flew in from different parts of the country. Many only met at such forums. They rarely got a chance to relax. Due to their busy schedules, they didn't take vacations for years. But here they were, near the sea, in Valencia, and T.I. was July. Timoteo was infinitely grateful to the organizers, his management, and his timely suppressed nobility. Otherwise, he would have never met Toya. On one of the days, Toya said that she must have been home in the evenings Natalia was coming. Even before Toya went to her mom, Natalia announced that she had found a real prince online. She said, I'm flying away, but I promise to return. Where are you heading again? Where did you find a prince? You brought it upon yourself. Remember, you asked to work with the Arab delegation. I'm a Japan expert, of course, but I agreed to help our agency. Although Arabic is not my forte, that's where I encountered either a prince or an illegitimate son of some sheik. I didn't really investigate, but he's outrageously good looking. Those black eyes can drive anyone crazy. Apparently, they drove you crazy. Are you planning to join his harem? How many wives does he have? What number will you be? Toya, don't consider me a fool. I'm not planning to get married. Remember the classics? We all learned a little something and somehow. Well, they taught me not just somehow, but conscientiously. I know what Arab mentality is. Being a foreigner doesn't matter. The main thing is that I'm a woman. As long as he desires me, there will be gifts and adoration. When it gets tiresome, I'll just leave and conveniently forget his name. I won't let it escalate to the point of being thrown out. I'll enjoy a month of luxury and adoration. You're certainly daring, but shouldn't there be some self-preservation? Aren't you afraid? As it turned out, she wasn't. What can you do with her? Discouraging her is pointless. Pretending to understand and saying she's doing everything right due to her conscience is the only option. The only thing left is to pray for her safe return. Oh, Natalia, when will you get the lessons life is giving you? How much can you risk? Toya couldn't cancel the meeting with her friend. She had been on pins and needles for a whole month already. Missing an evening with Timoteo was impossible. How many of these evenings were left? This time, Timoteo was invited to Toya's house for the first time. It would be improper to scrutinize her home. Timoteo discreetly observed what Toya had in her house. He wondered how she lived. She lived well, not in poverty. But she couldn't hide her loneliness. There was only one pillow on the bed and one cup on the table. And he was responsible for that. Now he was sure of it. If he couldn't undo everything, he could make it right. They say fate chooses. No, fate gives choices. And the decision is yours. Timoteo chose Toya. He had chosen her a long time ago, always knew that. Now he had to explain to fate that his choice was right. Fate, don't turn away, help. While Timoteo philosophically conversed with fate, materialism burst into Toya's apartment in the form of Natalia, who was tanned and radiant. She rushed towards Toya, hugged her, and kissed her. Natalia didn't notice Timoteo at first. When she saw him, she struck her signature pose. Oh my, what a man! Although the man seemed to react rather weakly. Usually, such beauty knocks people off their feet more actively. Understandably, he was taken. What a quiet person Toya was. Natalia, it's Timoteo. No way. Is that him? 
you could have at least hinted that we have a full-fledged Hollywood star here. He's no less than George Clooney. I apologize, I'm just amazed by this news. What wind blew such a handsome man in our direction? Timoteo was taken aback by the intensity and could only mutter. It's a coincidence. Business trip. It's not a coincidence. It's fate, Natalia said, with a fierce expression on her face, biting her lip, and approached Timoteo, her eyes gleaming. I see it clearly, if you hurt Toya, you'll die. Natalia, turn off the witch mode. Let's go and grab something to eat. What a friend she was. She was terrifying. It was clear how she managed to charm those Arabs. But it was unclear how they survived. With that kind of energy, she should have been in a leadership position, not working in a translation agency. They all sat down in the kitchen without ceremony. Everyone was tired. Toya and Timoteo had a workday. Natalia just came from her trip. Hungry, they didn't care about formalities. Natalia vividly described her Arabian vacation. They laughed and had a good time. Then Natalia said, I'm so tired of these flaky princes, her voice filled with melancholy shivers. I remember how Toya used to talk about you, Timoteo. I was insanely jealous. But why? You disappeared, got lost. If you get lost again now, I won't forgive you. You'll ruin the whole fairy tale about the enchanted princess and her savior prince. All right, knights and princesses, should we continue exchanging mysterious glances or go have coffee? They didn't have time to have a drink. Someone was banging on the door. Knocking, ringing, and even kicking. Toya got scared, Natalia rummaged in the cupboard looking for a rolling pin, and Timoteo went to open the door. A drunken man stood behind it, practically falling into the apartment. Toya, come here. Who's this? Should we carry him in or out? Bring him in, Toya sighed sadly. This is Nacho, my ex-husband. Wow, love hit him hard, didn't it? They helped Nacho up, set him in the corridor. They brought him smelling salts, water, and coffee. Then back to coffee. After an hour and a half, he started to understand where he was, but couldn't remember how he ended up there. Toya, how did I end up here? It's a mystery. You won't figure it out until you sober up. But I don't drink. Right, we see. Natalia defended Nacho. Toya, you know he doesn't drink. What could have happened for him to get this drunk? Nacho, do you remember how you got here? No. Neither where nor how. Guys, I'm sorry. Truly, I don't understand how I ended up at my ex-wife's place. It's called residual memory. When a person can't remember anything after an injury, fragments of memory surface. In your case, it's your ex-wife. It would have been better if it were something else. Did you hit your head anywhere? Timoteo, spare us your hospital humor. Well, he came, and he came. They didn't bother questioning Nacho about what happened. If he wanted, he would tell them himself. They put him to sleep. They sat there, finally drank their coffee. It was time to leave, but Timoteo couldn't leave Toya alone with Nacho in the same apartment. And he couldn't find a reason to stay. Resourceful Natalia came to the rescue and said directly, Toya, you don't want to spend the night here with your ex-husband, do you? No, but where can I go? I can't just leave him like this. And don't. I'll take care of it, and you accompany Timoteo. You should have a walk right now. Natalia, are you kicking me out of the house? Toya, I'm begging you, give me a chance. You know I've had my eye on Nacho for a long time. And now such an opportunity arises. Timoteo, let me tell you, seven years ago you were much more decisive. Will you wait another seven years? Timoteo, won't you leave a lady on the street and let her spend the night? Natalia simply pushed them out of the apartment. If you're so modest, take a stroll along the waterfront all night and don't bother me. I have big plans for tonight. Timoteo remembered his wild youth. 
He remembered how easily he entered relationships that quickly turned physical. But now he couldn't come up with something to say that would convince Toya to go with him to a hotel. Toya, where will you spend the night? Maybe we should go to my place? Yes. That simple yes undermined Timoteo. What an idiot he was. Why didn't he search harder? He wasted seven years of his life and now almost a week. She loves him. And she felt just as bad all those years. In the morning, Timoteo stared at the sleeping Toya for a long time, hesitating to wake her. What if she says, sorry, it was all a mistake? He couldn't bear it. She opened her eyes. Good morning. Did you sleep well? Yes, and not sleeping was even better. She reached for Timoteo and kissed him. His heart sank somewhere, and he felt goosebumps all over his body. Toya, we haven't been living very happy until today. It's time to change that. We should live for our own pleasure. What do you mean? With joy. Let's decide, will you come to my place or should I come to yours? I'm a blonde. I need everything repeated twice. Was that a proposal? Yes. I told you, I don't get it the first time. Say it again. Yes. Yes. They had three days left before their departure. They didn't want to part at all, but they both had tasks that couldn't be postponed. Timoteo needed to write a review of his colleague's work, and Toya had to form a group of translators skilled in technical translation for an international conference. Then Toya went to the hospital to see Anna. They strolled for almost an hour until a nurse came for Anna. Looking at the child's unhappy face, Toya almost burst into tears herself. She wanted nothing more than to take her little kitten home. The attending physician said that the examination results showed everything was fine with the girl. It was just her age. They would observe her for a couple more days, and then she could go home. No one was in the apartment. Natalia had left with Nacho. A parrot wandered aimlessly on the floor. It escaped from its cage on its own, but since it was old and hadn't flown in a long time, it couldn't return by itself. Poor thing, how long have you been wandering around? Your fate is pitiful. No food or drink. And what's this mess? Ah, uh, you were peeling off the wallpaper. Planning some renovations? Max, you're not a rodent, you're a bird. Toya extended her hand. Come, I'll feed you. Max said. Hello, 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 my little bird. And he hopped toward his hand. Toya took a shower, put on a light resort dress, and went to the park. They had arranged to meet there. Timoteo was eager to see Valencia's most famous park. He had a special fascination for palm trees. He would run up to each tree, hug it, and demand that Toya take a picture of him specifically with that palm tree. Oh my, Timoteo, are you planning to take photographs with every palm tree in this city as a keepsake? I'll print it life-size and cover the entire fence. Imagine how beautiful it will be, snowdrifts and cedar palms. And we have plenty of sun here. By the way, we'll have to fly north. Why? You said your mom is living there now. We should pay her a visit, introduce the future son-in-law. And I need to show off my bride and granddaughter to my parents. They've been eagerly waiting. Do you think Nacho will allow us to adopt Anna? Timoteo, aren't you rushing things? I've been holding back for so many years. Now I want it all at once. By the way, the fact that both your parents and mine live in the north is an extra reason to move there. Plus, if I understand correctly, it's your family matter to move to the north because of a husband. Why are you pressuring me like this? I need to think, take my time. Please, take your time. But you should only think about our future life together. Toya was talking to Timoteo, but she couldn't shake off the feeling that it was unreal. Here he was, right beside her. Beloved, the only man in her life. There couldn't be more happiness. If she closed her eyes, everything would disappear. I'll close them later when he leaves, but for now, I'll look into his eyes. 
The last day before departure was unbearable. Her heart would stop. Toya kept thinking that he would fly away any moment, and that would be it. She wouldn't see him again. She had become so accustomed to suffering from lost love that she couldn't believe in the possibility of happiness. Timoteo had similar feelings. He couldn't tear himself away from Toya. It felt like if he let go, he would lose her. She wanted to accompany him to the airport, but he forbade it. Let's say our goodbyes here. Farewell against the backdrop of departing planes would shatter our souls. It's a sign of hopelessness. Toya, as soon as Anif can fly, I'll be waiting for you both at my place. I love you and don't want to live without you. Please, don't disappear again, it's a bad habit. Toya gradually regained her composure. She immersed herself in work, which she had honestly neglected. Suddenly, she remembered that her wayward friend Natalia had disappeared somewhere. It was true that she hadn't called or messaged. It wasn't a good sign. Had she gotten herself into trouble again? But then Anna was discharged from the hospital, and there was no time to think about Natalia. Sorry, my friend, we'll come to your rescue a bit later. Natalia showed up on her own, and apparently, she didn't need to be rescued. As always, she was like a whirlwind and fireworks. It seemed like she was taking up too much space of the apartment. Anna rushed into her arms. She missed her so much. It's always so much fun with Aunt Natalia. And she brings gifts too. Shrieks, songs, dances, all at once. They made noise, played around. Anna started playing with her new toys, and the friends went to the kitchen. Toya could see that Natalia was bursting with the desire to share everything with her friend. It was unbearable to endure any longer. She had been silent for so many days. Toya assessed the situation and understood that it wasn't the right time for her. But now they could finally talk, like two happy women. Natalia's revelations were not a surprise to Toya. Knowing her friend well, she suspected that Natalia wouldn't let Nacho slip away this time. She had always believed that Toya underestimated Nacho, didn't understand the kind of husband she had found. And now, there was such an opportunity, Toya was settled, and Nacho was available. She hadn't intervened before, but what if they could reconcile again? And now, what? Toya was confident that Nacho had gotten himself into a mess and wouldn't escape. Natalia was saying something. Toya listened half-heartedly, as it was already clear. She reached for a cup, but it slipped and broke. Oh, Toya, thank goodness. What a great happiness indeed, to break a cup from the set. I'm a little bit clumsy. You're lucky. You're clumsy, but I think I'm out of my mind sometimes. Tell me, why am I such a fool? Every time I step on the same rake, I fell in love again, can't live without him. Toya, if you and Nacho still have any hope of saving your family, tell me, and I won't interfere. Natalia, you're a silly girl. What are you talking about? I forgot about him completely. So, it's up to you now. I'll only be glad. He's a good man. Too bad I ended up with him and ruined my life. By the way, why did he show up here looking so handsome? Well, you can say he went from one to another after you. First, second, third, and still not the right one, no one is needed. After breaking up with another woman, he was overwhelmed with longing. He got drunk. And his feet brought him to you. As your doctor said, residual memories. He remembered where he was happy. Oh, Toya, enough with the experiments already. Let's try to be happy. Are you going to see Timoteo? No, I'm not going. I'll fly. I thought I had made everything up in my mind. Timoteo couldn't live with the dream of meeting like I did. But you won't know unless you check. If I let happiness slip away again out of fear, there won't be a third chance. It seemed to me that Timoteo loves you. Don't break his heart again. And it won't be easy for me with Nacho. Damn these memories. They were sitting, crying, and comforting each other. They understood that fate had taken a sharp turn. The main thing was to guess which way to go. 
While there were doubts and speculations here in Valencia, in the north, Timoteo had no doubts about anything. He told his parents the story of his love with Toya. He announced that Toya and their daughter would arrive soon. As soon as he mentioned that he asked them to treat the girl as his own daughter, his mother Dahlia interrupted him. Son, don't disappoint me. I thought I raised a real man, but now you're behaving like a goofy youth. You're going to bring a woman into our home, a woman you've loved for so many years. It doesn't matter how many children she has. However, many there are, they're all ours. Timoteo approached, hugged his mother. He always knew he had the best parents in the world. And perhaps his dream of having a family like his parents would come true. It was the end of August when Toya decided it was time to fly. She and Timoteo spoke on the phone every day. He urged her, missed her, pleaded, come as soon as possible. Anna was healthy, a cheerful and restless child. Toya bought the tickets and called her mother. Mom, we'll be flying to you in a week. Toya, what happened? You were just here. Something happened. I'll fly over and tell you. Don't worry, everything is actually very good. Or are you not expecting us? Bite your tongue. What are you saying? Now I won't be able to sleep from excitement. Give me a hint at least. All right, I have a fiancé. I'm getting married. I'll come and introduce you. That's right. All the most eligible bachelors are here. Well, who would know better than you? The pre-flight preparations took so long that Natalia never got a chance to meet up. I wonder how things are going for her with Nacho. Well, let's postpone those conversations until the last day. But unexpectedly, Nacho showed up himself. He hadn't come around since the divorce, except for that incident with his memories getting triggered. And now he showed up looking disheveled, looking very lost. Oh, my heart senses a serious conversation. It's really not the time for conversations, especially heartfelt ones, especially with an ex-husband. But I can't push him away. Anna was happy that Daddy had come. While they talked, Toya tried to guess why he had come and what it meant for her. Besides wasting her time, that is. Nacho put Anna to bed and came to the kitchen. He sat down and asked for coffee. He drank and stayed silent. Nacho, don't drag it out. Did you come to say something? Speak up. Toya, I apologize for that circus with the horses. Honestly, I don't understand why I came. I don't remember much. Natalia told me later that Timoteo was here. The one who was Anna's father. I don't even remember him. Can you imagine? That's what bothers me the most. I didn't see the man of my wife's dreams. Natalia told me how he reappeared in your life. It's such a miracle. He even saved Anna. So, I understand that you two are together now? Not exactly. But in two days, Anna and I will fly to him. For now, as guests, and then we'll see. Nacho, I blame myself so much for agreeing to marry you. I ruined your life. Stop it, I wanted it myself. Now I understand that I shouldn't have forced you. It didn't help you or me. Okay, enough with noble gestures. I didn't come for that. I've realized that the best solution is to maintain good relations. I hope you're not against it. It's better than being enemies. Plus, Anna is my daughter, even if not by blood. I have another delicate question. I like Natalia, but she's your friend. It feels awkward to me. Oh, my dear. So, you came to seek my blessing? Unbelievable. You're asking your ex-wife for permission to date her friend. Nacho, don't be a fool. You won't find anyone more loyal than Natalia. She went through it when you chose me. She went through it when you married me. She visited as a guest. She suffered but stayed silent. I didn't even realize how serious it was. Oh, Nacho, you chose the wrong friend. You would have been happy long ago. If you like her, don't miss the chance. Thank you. I did choose the right wife after all. 
It's a shame I didn't love her. Damn, how did I not see Timoteo? If only I knew what the man of dreams looked like. I want everything to work out for you. Just don't take Anna away from me completely. Let the girl have two dads, it happens. Well, everything was clear now. There was no need to worry about Natalia. She had also found her man. She wouldn't jump after any Arab anymore. Natalia came to see them off. There were tears and sniffles, like she wasn't flying to her beloved, but to hard labor, to exile. She'd wither away, disappear, and we wouldn't see each other again. Tanya found it both pleasant and funny, such a drama. She even forgot about her personal life, she was worried so much. Mom, are we flying to Grandma again? Why? Are you against it? Didn't you miss her? I missed her. But are we going to fly to her all the time? We'll see. Another two hours on the plane, different kinds of thoughts were crawling into the head. Where was she rushing to? Dragging her daughter along. What if no one was waiting for us? It was just a momentary weakness, nostalgia for youth. It happened too fast. There was no time to think and evaluate. What if the chaos of events and the euphoria of the meeting were mistaken for love? Maybe love had long passed? Just pleasant memories? No. Toya was completely sure of herself. She just didn't believe that someone else could experience such strong feelings. As always, she thought that only she had such love, no one else was capable of it. And she was unworthy of such feelings. Is it an inflated self-importance or low self-esteem? That's how Toya flew to hell to marry the devil. Timoteo arrived at the airport an hour before their arrival. He couldn't sit still at home. He couldn't stay there, couldn't bear it. He paced around the arrivals hall. His parents were eager to meet the bride. Timoteo, with a strong determination, stopped them at the entrance. His nerves were already on edge. He had no strength to watch over them. Set the table. They'll arrive hungry. You know how they feed you on planes. His mother looked at him with pleading eyes, but he didn't give in. They lived their whole life without Toya. They could endure a couple more hours. But he couldn't wait any longer. Where was that plane? It was time already. The flight's arrival was announced. Timoteo rushed into the arrivals area. Just a little longer to wait. Passengers started coming out into the hall. He saw Toyo with their daughter. Now he felt a bit relieved. They had arrived. Just a few more minutes, and Timoteo was hugging Toya. The little girl looked at the unfamiliar uncle with curiosity, wondering why he was kissing her mom so tightly. While they were driving to the city, Toya tried to say a few times that she would go live with her mother, but Timoteo didn't want to hear it. We will live with me, and now we are going to my parents. They are going crazy. They were ready to run to the airport to see you. Mom will worry. She knows that we have already arrived. Well, call her and say that we will come tomorrow. The parents were waiting at the gate. How long have they been here? It's unclear, but definitely not just arrived. Who was more worried is the question. They say mothers-in-law never liked their daughters-in-law. Not true, Dahlia immediately liked Toya. She wanted such a wife for her son. Beautiful, smart, sensitive, and in love with Timoteo. Anna was looking at unfamiliar people they brought her to. Who is this, Mom? These are your grandparents. But I already have grandparents. Believe me, the more the better. There are never too many grandparents. The day passed in a haze. Toya had no experience of interacting with her husband's parents. She was shy, kept the conversation going, but was afraid of saying something wrong. It's a strange feeling when you want to please people you see for the first time, and your future depends on whether you please them or not. It turned out to be so simple if no one pretends or tries to look better than they are. It was easy and straightforward with Timoteo's parents. After two hours, they were chatting as if they had known each other for a long time. 
Dahlia immediately started calling Toy a daughter, as if her son brought his wife to meet them, not just a girlfriend. It was pleasant and unfamiliar. Anna quickly settled in, realizing that these grandparents were just like the ones she knew. They gave her all the delicious treats and didn't let her get off their laps. It's good that she now has many grandmas and grandpas. As Toya and Anna were heading to the car, Dahlia called her son. Timoteo, son. Why didn't you say that you have a daughter? Why did you abandon her? Mom, what are you talking about? This is Toya's daughter from her previous husband. Are you blind? This is your daughter. Don't say anything now, but ask Toya later. I'm sure she will confirm it. You said you had a romance. Think about it. I know it will all make sense. And I don't need to count. She looks like you in childhood. Timoteo believed it immediately. How did he not realize it himself? He wouldn't even ask. It was clear enough. Poor Toya, how difficult it must have been for her. Now all the troubles were behind. No one would dare to hurt them. The thought that he has a daughter didn't quite fit in his head. It couldn't happen so suddenly, he needed to get used to it. But a wave of joy had already started. It would reach his head soon, and he would understand everything. The next day was another celebration. They went to Toya's mother and took Timoteo's parents with them. They should meet. Mother didn't know where to seat the dear guests. Her daughter and granddaughter, the groom or husband, and now the parents. Mother was exclaiming and worrying, confused, not knowing what to do. Michaelo took charge. He understood that if he didn't intervene, they would keep wandering in the yard, and it was already time to have a meal. At the table, the parents enthusiastically discussed the wedding and where the young couple would live. No one asked Toya and Timoteo. Any thoughts about Valencia? No, only here. Everything was close, all together. And Valencia would be a perfect place for vacations. They had already planned their children's lives for many years ahead, and everything was thought out so well. The mothers had tears in their eyes. The fathers were reserved but excited. More tears, sighs, and kisses for Anna, an endless meal, and the shining eyes of Toya and Timoteo. If things continued like this, there wouldn't be time for a wedding. In the evening, Natalia called. Hi, dear. How are you doing there? I can't even understand it myself. It's so good that it's hard to believe. Timoteo's parents are unreal. We've been visiting guests all day long. They show us to everyone like circus monkeys. No time to rest and regain ourselves. I noticed yesterday that Timoteo looks at Anna in a strange way. You know, so attentively. I think he suspects something. Maybe someone hinted him? Who? Nobody knows. Mom might have some suspicions, but even she can't know for sure. I've never told her Anna's father's name. Anyway, enough about me. How about you? Nacho wants to introduce me to his parents. I'm scared. They didn't like you, and I'm definitely not their type. I'm too old for their precious son. You should go. They hated me so much that anyone else would be better. And then Nacho has already proven that his parents' opinion is not the ultimate truth. I think they'll be more open to conversation now. Their son has grown up, and they'll be afraid to impose conditions on him. Don't offend them there's they've had enough. Well, I'm not such a beast. And are you planning to come back? Yes, I'll be back soon. But you know, there's something here that I sense I'll have to follow my husband up north too. I want to be a part of the family tradition. Wait, what about your job? Darling, do you think they don't need translators here? By the way, it's the largest scientific center. It's so powerful here. And foreigners come in crowds. Once I arrive, we'll sit down and chat like old times. They chose the wedding day, discussed everything, made decisions, and Toya started getting ready to go home. She needed to quit her job, pack and send her belongings. They decided not to sell the apartment. 
Timoteo's parents were already at an age where they needed to go to the seaside for vacation. So they'd take turns going there. And Anna needed to visit the seaside more often too. With so many grandparents now, they'd take care of their granddaughter. Plus, it would be more enjoyable for them to live in their own apartment during vacations. Later on, once they left with her mother and Anna grew up, she might want to live in the South. The cycle of visiting guests started again. This time, they bid farewell to Toya and Anna. They knew they were leaving for a short time, but it was still sad. The mothers held back tears again, while the fathers comforted them with composed faces. They tried until the last moment to convince Toya to leave Anna behind, but Toya stood her ground, no. Firstly, it is unclear how long she'll have to stay in Valencia. Secondly, there are so many of you here, and I'll be alone there. How Timoteo didn't want to let Toya go. Every parting felt like forever. Sadness and worry overwhelmed him. He drove Toya to the airport, suppressing panic within himself. She was leaving again, disappearing. He consoled himself that it was the last time that they wouldn't have to part again. In the back seat, Anna was talking to her doll with a very serious expression. Her brows were furrowed. Perhaps the doll had misbehaved greatly. Timoteo looked at her through the rearview mirror. His heart squeezed. He has a daughter. And he only found out now. And now he was bidding farewell to both of them while he remains waiting and missing them. In the waiting area, they stood embracing each other. Timoteo held Anna in his arms, kissing her and whispering softly, My beloved girls, come back soon. I feel bad without you. Anna, I'll miss you. I'll miss you too. She wrapped her arms around Timoteo's neck and kissed him. Mom, now I have many grandmas and grandpas. And maybe a child can have two dads? Timoteo, I want you to be my dad. Well, if you want, I will be. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.